thank you so much, Mrs. Eva Zazimarova, uh, President of the Chair Academy of Sciences, for hosting us here tonight uh, in the building of the Academy. It's a honor for us to be your guest uh, in this very uh, beautiful room. So, Mrs. Zajimarova, Mrs. President, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Jerome. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to greet you on behalf of the Czech Academy of Sciences on today's festive occasion commemorating the 30th anniversary of the commencement of Sephiroth activities in the Czech Republic. Today's conference or event is a clear indication that this initiative has been successful. I am also very pleased that the host of this conference is our academy that is based mainly in Prague. This proves that Prague is not only a traditional city of European culture and a crossroad of European history, but that it is becoming a desired and inspirational meeting place for scientists from around the world. I also appreciate that there will be talks about issues related to the knowledge, powers and academic freedom in Europe and beyond. In this sense, this year's anniversary is a good opportunity to look back. In particular, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in a few weeks, namely on 30 June, 12 years will have passed since the historically first extraordinary session of the Academy Assembly of the Czech Academy of Sciences. It was held in response to the liquidating budget that was planned for the Academy by the then Czech government. At that time, we were facing similar problems that our colleagues from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences have faced very recently. Fortunately, in our case, and thanks to the effort of the Academic Council during the presidency of my predecessor, Professor Drahoš, we managed to prevent the worst and preserve the Czech Academy of Sciences as well as the most important thing, the freedom of scientific research in this country. This I consider a clear success. I am therefore very glad that it is the Czech Academy of Sciences that became the host of Sefres in 1991. It is very interesting to follow the Sefres history, which began with an effort to simply resume scientific exchanges between between France and Central Europe. However, CEFRES has continued in, in its efforts to build networks and relationships between research teams from France on the one hand and research institutes from the Czech Republic and also from Hungary, Poland and Slovakia on the other. Gradually, CEFRES has begun to offer even more a reflection on current scientific topics and challenges that opened up to the social sciences and humanities through lectures, seminars, publications of scholarships for doctoral students and postdocs, a completely new milestone which further supported mutual relations was the creation of so-called CEFRES platform in November 2014 as a new basis for Czech friend, for sorry from French Czech cooperation. We are very pleased that the Czech Academy of Sciences, together with Charles University, has become one of the important partners of this platform. Finally, let me make a small comparison here. In the 1990s, there was a fundamental need to establish or renew contacts in the field of French Czech cooperation operation that had been disrupted for decades by communistic regime. To a large extent, and no doubt thanks to the work done by Sefres, this has succeeded. It might seem that the task of the 1990s has been fulfilled. However, it turns out that history is not over. Also, some have unfortunately mistakenly thought so. Today's situation in Europe and the globalized world in which France and the Czech Republic are an integral part raises new questions, including questions for the social sciences and humanities. I therefore wish all of us and the Sefres in particular, good luck in finding meaningful answers and perhaps also some advices. Thank you very much. Dear President of Academy of Sciences, His Excellencies, dear rectors, vice rectors, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am very ho honored to be here on the anniversary of the 30th years. Uh, CEFRES uh, take place in, in Prague together with Charles University and Academy of Sciences. And it is, I think, with uh, 
only short period, which is not a suppressed flourishing, but uh, most of the is, is very successful based on the traditional uh, very good cooperation between the French uh, colleagues and the Czech colleagues uh, in the scientific area. And I, uh, I should mention that our foundation uh, of university in 1347 in January is tightly connected to the Pope of Clement VI. Uh, the professor of Sorbonne and the teacher of the Charles IV, the founder of our university. And now it's coming through to the 4U plus universities together with Sorbonne and other universities in, you know, in, in European Union together to, to sharing the activities. And the CEFRES is coming to Prague very shortly after the Velvet Revolution and uh, opening and uh, helping us to our students and our our professors and teachers to renew uh, uh, the social sciences, humanity sciences, uh, which was seriously damaged during the, uh, the years before. Uh, the Sefres has a very significant um, research environment in Czech and the Central Europe, which taking together, as mentioned, the scientists and the students, not only from Czech Republic, but also from the neighboring countries. Uh, the Sefres it's also put uh, very important um, influence to developing some uh, study subjects and research areas on our university, as example, the French studies uh, on uh, or European studies uh, on our faculty of the uh, social sciences and uh, starting also the uh, joint degree programs and also the Cotutel, which are influenced uh, and involved for our colleagues from CEFRES. Uh, as uh, Professor Zajimalova mentioned, in uh, November 21, 2014, uh, we uh, signed a new type of partnership, as mentioned, the platform of CEFRES, where is a closer cooperation between Charles University, CEFRES, and Academy of Science. Uh, the Charles University is uh, contributing the two fellowships for the postdocs who are involved in the mutual research project. And we believe that in the uh, near future, it uh, should, be, should be increasing. And also the joint courses between CEFRES, our faculties, our academia uh, is organized. And I believe that also in the future, uh, these activities uh, will, be, uh, will be growing up. I would like to, to thank the colleagues from CEFRES the colleagues from French Embassy, uh, French Institute, uh, uh, Eva Zashimalova, Vice Rector uh, Lenka Rovna, uh, who is involved in these topics. And uh, I believe that the next uh, 30 years in CEPRES uh, will be growing up to network between the Czech and French scientists and also uh, put to, uh, to hard cooperation between the Czech and France. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rector, for uh, these kind words. Uh, I'm giving now the floor to François Joseph Rudjou, if uh, he's ready to talk now. Okay, dear colleagues, I am particularly glad to join you for the 30th anniversary of the French Center for Research in Humanities and Social Sciences, the CEFRES, and to take the floor besides our church partners, Charles University in Prague, and the Academy of Science of the Czech Republic. CEFRES was, was uh, created in uh, 1991 and the CNRS entered into partnership with the French Ministry for Foreign Affairs in uh, 2007. Anniversaries like this one are very important milestones in the existence of a research laboratory. And as you surely know, the CNRS has, had wished to celebrate his own 80th anniversary in 2019 with uh, brightness. Uh, it, was, it was not just a, a communication operation. It was also a way to mark the achievement of the CNRS uh, since uh, 1939, a way to shed light on its role in the progress of science and, and the opportunity to give a sense of community and proudness to all persons who were or who are related to the CNRS. So I, I commend, therefore, and I thanks uh, Jérôme Hurtaud, the director of the CEFRES, 
and all our colleagues there for having scheduled the today, today's and tomorrow's event uh, for celebrating its own anniversary. Internationalization of research is an urgent concern for the French Ministry of, for Higher Education and Research, for the CNRS, and for the Institute uh, for Humanities and Social Sciences. And I know that is also a concern for our Czech partners. It is only through solid integration into international scientific networks that is possible to renew research dynamics acquire and develop new theoretical and methodological references and widely, widely disseminate the results of scientific production. Um, for doing that, our main tool uh, in the CNRS is a network of research units abroad, cooperated by the CNRS uh, and uh, uh, with the French Ministry for Europe on uh, Foreign Affairs. We are running 25 of uh, such research laboratories called UMIF around the world. And this situation is unique in Europe, even if Germany is now creating with a great success its Marian centers. I cannot emphasize too much how important and fruitful is for us the bond we share with the French Ministry for Foreign Affairs. This partnership gives to the UMIF large scale mission on access to rich resources. But one of the challenges for this network is to open up to local partnerships so that the units abroad are better integrated in the local research networks. And UMIF is a kind of revolving door open towards France and open towards its geographic area. It is thus one of the mission of UMIF to create this link between local research communities and the French and European research communities. And CEFRES is exemplary in this matter. The platform created in 2014 allowed the integration of such partners, Charles University in Prague and the Academic of Science of the Czech Republic in the UMIF and our cooperation agreement was renewed in 2018. Around the world, it's only in Oxford and in Berlin that we are finding such an integration. The platform has indeed fostered a very fruitful partnership for joint Franco-Czech research, research works that includes the training of young researchers and also the tandem incubator program, which is a, a very original action to launch new binational research projects, pro projects and which is support on the CNRS side by the mobility of a researcher in Prague. And I, I believe, I profoundly believe that this kind of action, this kind of design that can contribute to reinforce collaborative research program between French and Czech researchers and to give rise to new, truly innovative research programs. And the first tandem team uh, with uh, Lucek Broch, researcher from the Czech Academy of Science and Virginie Vate, CNRS researcher, has already proven the efficiency of the action with a successful application to the highly competitive ERC Consolidator Grant. So CEFRES, it is at the same time a research laboratory in social sciences and humanities and a cradle of new practices and new action, which could be and which will be replicated elsewhere in the world. And CEFRES is also a testimony of the academic value and moral value that we are sharing. So the CNRS is particularly grateful to all the members of the CEFRES, past and present, to the French Embassy in Prague, and to his French and Czech partners for our excellent, excellent relation and for the high quality of the scientific activities we are uh, producing all together. 
Thank you very much. I would like to add a few sentences, and I am aware of how privileged uh, I am to be the director of an institution like CIFRES um, that was just being born when, uh, personally, I discovered uh, Central Europe and Prague for the first time of my life in 1991. Um, CIFRES was founded uh, only two years after the collapse of the communist regimes at the initiative of the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. That's why uh, the speech by the Secretary of State for European Affairs is so important for us. And I welcome the presence among us uh, of the French Ambassador to the Czech Republic, Mr. Alexis uh, Duterte, and also, of course, the Director of uh, the French Institute, uh, uh, Luc Lévy, and Véronique debord Lazaro, who is the scientific attaché at the French Embassy. Uh, the French Center for Research in Humanities and Social Sciences um, had as its primary mission the revival of scientific relations between France and Central Europe in the process of change. And CEFRES initially followed and observed the great transformation of so-called, at that time, post-communist countries, while becoming also a showcase uh, for French human and social sciences. Since 2007, uh, 2007, uh, it has enjoyed a privileged relationship with the CNRS. So I thank again, uh, Mr. Uh, Director uh, from CNRS for being here uh, with us. And uh, uh, CFS has supported the work of several hundred uh, young and not so young researchers uh, for 30 years and developed a solid cooperation with its partners. Since 2015, uh, the CFS platform has united CFS with the Czech Academy of Sciences and Charles University in Prague. So it's very important for us to see, to see you, uh, the president and the rector at my side. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute uh, to two crucial persons with whom we have planned this conference, uh, Mrs. Lankarovna, uh, vice rector of Charles University and president of CEFRES uh, Scientific uh, Committee and Mrs. Tatiana Petrasova. Uh, who has been responsible at the Academy for the cooperation with CEFRES for the past eight years and whose mission has just come to an end. So thank you very much, Tanka, for everything you did uh, for this cooperation. For 30 years, uh, directors have succeeded one another. Researchers have spent one of several years here. Uh, PhD students have brought their curiosity and dynamism. All of them gradually, uh, gradually uh, shaping a beautiful, recognized, and to put it with a touch of sentiment, very attaching uh, institution. Uh, those who have testified in the short videos uh, that we have been broadcasting on our Facebook page every Thursday for several months on the occasion of this anniversary, uh, recall uh, with emotion their uh, stay in Prague. And the archives, which we keep in the office, offer touching traces of the hundreds of visits, the countless conferences, seminars, workshops, and the many efforts, big and small, of all of those who have made suffrage what it is today, year after year. It is thanks to you, uh, past and present PhD students, researchers, directors, almost all of ex-directors of CFS as are with, with us tonight on Zoom. I would like to thank them for, for, for that. Deputy Director, we have only one, uh, uh, and I want to mention her, Claire Madel, because she has served and continues to serve the institution without counting our time. Uh, assistants, colleagues, and partners, it is, it is thanks to you that one of the far distant successors of Marie Elisabeth Ducreux, the first director of CEFRES, and who so well incarnates CEFRES by the patience she has shown for it until today. Uh, it is thanks to you that one of her far distant successors finds himself so well surrounded to celebrate this anniversary, which is above all, above all your anniversary. But nothing would be worse than a pompous and self-satisfied celebration of this anniversary. It's not in the tradition of humanities and social sciences, which are holders of a critical project. Um, to let a trickle of lukewarm water flow, history never stops. It is its motion that concerns us, 
Uh, and this is why we have decided to use CEFRES, uh, to use this anniversary as an analyzer in order to focus our attention during this conference on the transformations that have affected and, and are affecting humanities and social, social, social sciences today. 30 years of pre-existence of CEFRES at the heart of Central Europe have made, uh, have made CEFRES an implicated witness for the development of the European level in the structuring and financing of research, in the internationalization, in the intensification of competition and the structural transformations that affect uh, our universe. The title of this conference, Knowledge, Power and Academic Freedom, summarizes perhaps in a slightly provocative way our intention. Knowledge, knowledge is our raison d'être. Uh, there is no greater accomplishment for a researcher than to sign a paper that sheds light on a misunderstood or misinterpreted reality, or to publish a book that develops uh, original thought. Power, power is our best enemy. Sometimes power is our protector and provides for our needs, and sometimes it abdicates its responsibility, manipulates us, or even muzzles us. This is why we have special privileges, so-called academic freedom. Academic freedom is an indispensable condition of our autonomy, of our ability to interpret the, the, the reality and to be critical. And knowledge, power, and academic freedom form a virtuous triad in some cases. Elsewhere, they form a configuration that is deadly for, not, for knowledge. Knowledge is a common good of a society, as Mr. Clement Bonne said before. This is why uh, we are so pleased to welcome to our ceremony a privileged witness of our turbulent times, Professor Mikhail Ignatieff, Rector and President of the Central European University since 2016. Mr. Ignatieff uh, was born in Canada. He received his PhD in history at Harvard University. He has served among other prestigious uh, academic positions as Edward Muro Chair of Press, Politics and Public Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Um, he has been visiting uh, scholar at OHSS also uh, a bit uh, um, before. He has published several books on different topics uh, and is also an international uh, commentator on contemporary issues uh, such as democracy, human rights, uh, governance, uh, etc. And he has also a rich political background, having been a member of parliament in Canada in the past and leader of the Liberal Party. After 2011, uh, Mr. Ignatieff distanced himself somewhat from uh, active politics, daily politics, I would say, concentrating instead on research and teaching. But in a way, politics uh, caught up with him in Hungary uh, where, as rector of the CEU, he had to face the strong hostility, to put it uh, mildly, uh, of the head of the government in that uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring country. For all these reasons, I am pleased that Prof. Ignatieff has agreed to give this uh, inaugural lecture on a subject that he knows from every angle. Uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, Professor Ignatieff. I know you are busy. Tomorrow, for instance, you have... Um, um, uh, a meeting with uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, the Nobel Prize, um, the Peruvian writer. So thank you uh, very much for your time and I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, it's distinguished company. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be part of the anniversary of the Center for Research in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, it's a very distinguished collaboration between two absolute centers of intellectual life, Paris and Prague, and it's been going on since 1991, and that's also the 30th anniversary of my university. So I like 30th anniversaries, and I'm happy to be part of this one. I'm also delighted to be with you at the Czech Academy of Sciences, which is a great institution, and also to be sharing a platform with uh, the rector of Charles University, uh, one of the things I know about Charles is that it was founded in 1348. And uh, that reminds us, I think, of something that's fundamental to this story, which is how old universities are. 
how long their struggle for autonomy and academic freedom uh, goes back. Um, if you think about uh, a great Polish university, for example, the Jagiellonian University in Krakow was founded in 1364. Uh, if you go to Hungary, the oldest university in Hungary is the University of Pech, which was founded in 1367. So I think it's important to begin there because universities have been a constituent part of civil society in Central and Eastern Europe since the Middle Ages. Um, we have a long, ancient, well-established university tradition in Central and Eastern Europe, and it joins the great traditions of Sorbonne and Bologna and Oxford and Cambridge, also great medieval institutions. Um, why am I starting here? Because it, to make the simple point that universities are among the oldest self-governing institutions in the world, and they've been struggling for centuries uh, to secure their independence from the church and from the state, and this battle, which goes back to the Middle Ages, um, is one of the oldest battles in Europe for intellectual and democratic freedom. So in 2021, we need to draw strength from this very old and deep tradition uh, in Europe. Uh, during the communist era, and it, reference has been made to this, um, universities lost their freedom and they regained them painfully after 1989. And I think since 1989, I don't know whether the rector of Charles University or the head of the Academy of Sciences will agree with me, but I think we've been living in some ways the best years of university life in Central and Eastern Europe uh, in, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and I think the other point uh, is that uh, the university across Europe has acquired a centrality to the economic and productive uh, life of their societies that is just unprecedented. I mean, just think about what the COVID experience teaches us. Um, it was in university labs that some of the crucial vaccines were developed. It was in university labs that some of the cru crucial diagnostic tools were developed. Um, the lives of everybody at this conference literally depend on the science that came out of university labs in the last uh, 20 years. And we can all thank our lucky stars that this terrible plague arrived in 2020 and not in 1980 uh, because the exponential growth of university science in the last generation has literally saved the lives of many of our fellow citizens. <clears throat> Universities are now the knowledge engine of 21st century economies. And this is both a wonderful thing, but it's also an enormous challenge um, because we have to preserve our autonomy and our independence from very, very powerful forces, uh, from corporations, from the big pharmaceutical companies that are trying to buy our intellectual property, from governments that are trying to use uh, intellectual property and our advice. Um, <clears throat> and we're in an unprecedented situation, it seems to me, uh, in that um, university-based knowledge is more important than ever before in guiding public policy. And we have more data than ever before. Someone said to me that um, modern societies, modern digital societies generate more information about human beings in the last two or three years than have been gathered together in the whole of uh, recorded history. And universities are the custodians, the archivists, the curators of this enormous, exponentially growing uh, digital knowledge. This gives us power, um, but it also gives us responsibility. And it gives us immense frustration when we see patiently developed social science knowledge, patiently developed epidemiological models ignored uh, in the middle of the COVID crisis. <clears throat> COVID both demonstrates the centrality of university knowledge for the future of our societies, but it also illustrates painfully 
what it's like when we're ignored and not listened to. Um, but I think my theme, just to, to, to get to it, is that academic freedom is absolutely central to the very future of democracy itself. This is less obvious a thought than you might think. I mean, everybody in this room will assume that to be true. But I think one of the things that we've discovered in the populist era is that a lot of people don't have that view of democracy at all. And a lot of our democratic leaders don't have that view of democracy at all. Uh, for most people um, that we serve, uh, democracy simply means majority rule, rule by the people. Uh, and the idea that self-governing institutions are a critical piece of democracy is often not well understood in our societies. A liberal democracy means majority rule balanced by minority rights, constitutional protections, independence of the judiciary, freedom of the press, and crucially, self-governing institutions. What Montesquieu famously called les corps intermédiaires. Um, universities are the oldest of these institutions and in many ways now the most important. We must be free to choose our programs. We must be free to hire and fire. We must be free to select our own students and we must free to pursue our own research. This freedom, needless to say, has to be balanced by accountability to the societies and governments that pay for us. Uh, <clears throat> this accountability is both financial, but it's also social. Um, and this is one of, the, I think, the issues we need to grapple with um, uh, very clearly. Universities have enormous power. I've referred already to the intellectual property that gives us power. But we're, we also have power because we're the engines of the modern meritocracy. We credential the leaders of tomorrow. Our credentials, our degrees, are immensely valuable to those who seek them, but they are also a key reinforcer of inequality. And that inequality generates resentment, and that resentment divides democratic societies. And I think we're all familiar, uneasily familiar, that credentialed inequality is in many ways harder to shake and harder to change than inequalities of wealth or class or even of race because credentialed inequality is so easily legitimized. Those with credentials from universities like ours believe that they've earned uh, their credentials and they've consequently earned the status, the income, the elite position that those credentials provide them. And this sense of entitlement that our credentials uh, hand out every day of the year, this entitlement creates resentment um, among those who don't have uh, these credentials. And so <clears throat> we are at the very center of a bitter and divisive debate about credentialed inequality in, in our societies. We both study this problem but in some deep way, we are the problem. And that's uh, a drama that we are uh, working through. Um, as a university leader, I'm aware that our legitimacy as an institution um, depends on having very high standards about those credentials, insisting that our students and our faculty measure up uh, and preserve the authority of these credentials. Um, but I also know that in order to preserve the legitimacy of our credentialing function, um, we need to make sure that everyone in our society can secure access to these credentials and that our doors as an institution are never closed and that we reach out through recruitment strategies that are targeted everyone in our society that is excluded marginalized or discriminated against. And we need to say very clearly as institutions, we're here for you. And we don't always say that. And uh, it's rendered us as a university vulnerable to counterattack. And we know how powerful this populist attack on experts, on elites, um, on the entitlement of the credentialed elite 
We know how powerful these attacks can be, and we know how dangerous this is to the authority and status of universities, and how, frankly, how threatening it can be to our budgets if we're dependent, as many of our state institutions in Europe are, on the political favor of those who are elected and those who uh, are, have to be responsive to these populist tides in our, in, uh, among our fellow citizens. So what, what can we do about this? We have to defend our freedom and our autonomy and our authority by demonstrating that we serve, we enable, we empower, and we're accountable. Um, now, so those are some of the challenges that I think are generic to universities everywhere in Western and North, and North America. Um, but I wanna now turn a little bit to some of the challenges that are specific to this region that has become my home. Um, let's recall the history. Um, universities were muzzled during the authoritarian era. I hardly need tell the rector of Charles University that free thought was not to be found at Charles University in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. It was found instead in the apartments that Charles University professors who'd been dismissed or were unable to teach. Uh, it was in those those private apartments that free thought remained in Prague. And it was in those apartments that French scholars and British scholars and even a few Canadians showed up to give lectures in these private apartments. Intellectual freedom was kept alive. It's a very heroic chapter in the history of Czech intellectual life, as it is a heroic chapter in the life of uh, Warsaw intellectual life and Budapest intellectual life. And these are sources of pride. And many of those people who were dismissed from university and then came back in the 90s to found and rebuild free institutions um, are, are people that we should remember with deep affection and respect. Many of them are now reaching retirement age and they're passing uh, from the active scene in university life. But uh, I want to, as a rector, tip my hat to all of them because they kept the flame of liberty alive in, in Eastern Europe and we should all be grateful to them. And we should remember the greatness, the pure intellectual grandeur of this intellectual tradition. I, for example, have never ceased to learn from Jan Patochka's incredible lectures and initially given in private apartments in Prague uh, that eventually were collected in his um, great collection, Plato and Europe. So this is the tradition from which free institutions were rebuilt uh, in the 90s at the end of the, the Cold War. And my university, Central European University, was part of this. It was founded in 1991, just as uh, Sefres was, uh, by Hungarian, Czech, and Polish dissidents. It was funded by another uh, Hungarian emigre, George Soros, and its purpose was to liberate the humanities and social sciences from the ideological grip of communism and train a new generation in the habits and skills of democratic freedom. And crucial to the founding of CEU and to the rebuilding of Charles University and the rebuilding of the great universities in Poland was the idea that democratic a democratic transition will be impossible without democratic citizens. And where do you train democratic citizens? You train them in universities. And that task, training democratic citizens for freedom, remains as critical in this region. In fact, it's even more critical today than it was in 1991. And this idea that free universities are essential for a free society was a controversial idea in 1991. Uh, and we forget at our peril that uh, while CU actually began in Prague and great social scientists like Ernest Gellner returned to teach in Prague, uh, the idea of a free university here, a new university dedicated to the democratic transition was pretty controversial. Václav Klaus didn't like it one little bit and CU was effectively expelled from uh, Prague in 1993, and we then reestablished ourselves in Budapest because Mr. Mechiar, then in power in Slovakia, didn't want us to come to, Slo to uh, Bratislava. We need to remember, in other words, that there was always, even at the beginning of the democratic tran transition, deep resistance 
to the idea of democratic uh, universities uh, who seek to train democratic citizens for democratic societies. And this opposition has always been there. And <clears throat> CU then established ourselves in Budapest and we attracted students from the region and now from the entire world. And we've made ourselves into a research intensive graduate school in the social sciences and humanities in downtown Budapest. And we understood another key thing I think about academic freedom is that it's not the business of a university as a institution to be a political player. A university is not an NGO and a university is not a political party. Um, each individual private member of a university should be free and must be free to comment critically on the politics of, of the society which they serve and they live in. But it's not the role of universities to take collective positions on public matters. And CE always took that position. We stayed out of the political battle in uh, Budapest. We kept our side of the, the bargain of academic freedom uh, to the best of our ability. <clears throat> but when uh, Mr. Orban was running a uh, election campaign in 2017, authoritarian populists need enemies. They need enemies at their stature. And Mr. Orban decided in a straight piece of political calculation that he needed an enemy to rally his troops, uh, to sustain his political narrative. And he chose the founder of our university, George Soros, as his enemy and then mounted a uh, attack using the law to make it impossible for CU to continue to operate there. We were accredited in Hungary, we were accredited in New York, and he essentially said, you can't stay here unless you have an agreement with my government. We then sought to have an agreement with that government, but no uh, agreement uh, was possible. Uh, and uh, so uh, we had to, um, resist as best we could. And I, I think we learned some things that are important about um, the politics of academic freedom in Central and Eastern Europe. We mobilized international support. Universities around the world, including uh, the Czech universities, bombarded Mr. Orban's mailbox with petitions and letters and support. But the critical support came from within our own society, from Budapest. Um, we had at one memorable moment at the end of May 2017, 80,000 people marching past our window, um, chanting a slogan that I hope you will bear in mind. They were chanting in Hungarian, free universities in a free society. This was the largest demonstration in Hungary since the end of the Cold War, and they understood essentially the key thing I'm trying to get across, which is they understood the fundamental connection between their freedom as democratic citizens and the freedom of universities. <clears throat> Again, this interconnection between democratic freedom and university freedom and academic freedom needs to be stressed because one of the, I think, the damage that we inside the academy have done has been to construe academic freedom as our freedom, as the privilege of our kind of institutions. And it is widely understood by citizens as your freedom, your privilege. And I think that <laughs> as long as that remains true, we are vulnerable. Um, academic freedom is not the freedom of academics. It's not the privilege of an elite ca caste. It's a freedom integral to democracy itself. If universities cannot make the case to the democratic public that their freedom is integral to everyone's freedom, we will be defenseless when authoritarian leaders rise to power and make war on privileged, entitled, spoiled liberal elites in ivory towers. You've heard these charges a thousand times, <clears throat> but they are credible to the public because academics have not made a visceral connection between democratic freedom and their freedom. Because we badly need people's support. We need to earn it by communicating clearly to our fellow citizens. We need to communicate by producing research that makes their lives better. And we need to make absolutely sure that everyone's sons and daughters have a chance at the education that we offer. Now, <clears throat> we lost our battle with Mr. Orban. 
because the university can't win a battle against a government that's determined to use law to force you out. So now, as you know, we're in Vienna and we've been welcomed by an Austrian government and a city government that understands the enormous value of internationally competitive free institutions. Now, what have we left behind in Hungary? The expulsion of CU is only the first step in a consolidation of control over the media, cultural institutions, and other universities. As you may know, most universities in Hungary have now been privatized. Their assets have been handed over to university boards stacked with government supporters. And their, both their private assets and their intellectual agenda are now controlled by these boards. This is an absolutely new development in European higher education. And what begins in Hungary has a nasty way of happening in the Czech Republic and in Poland. I hope not. Uh, you're going to have to stand up and make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, the European Commission has reacted and says that they won't channel EU funds to these privatized institutions. But the Hungarian government has said, just fine, we'll do without the money. So understand what's happened here. It's, this is part of the change, but there's another change I need to mention to you. One of them is that having expelled us, a US accredited institution, Viktor Orban has invited to Budapest, Fudan University from Shanghai. And over the next five years, Chinese workers will build a campus on the banks of the Danube at a cost of 1.5 billion euros, paid for, I hasten to add, by the Hungarian taxpayer, who will be required to repay the loan provided by the Chinese government. So understand what's happening here. Fudan is a very substantial university, but its charter explicitly acknowledges the supreme authority of the Communist Party of China. And you can be absolutely certain of one thing, the political science classes at Fudan, if there are any, will not contain a word of criticism of the, of the Chinese regime, or for that matter, of the Hungarian regime. So we have entering into Europe an institution that does not correspond to the foundational values of European academic freedom. And this is an issue for every European government. Uh, it's already an issue, not it hasn't been started with Fudan. There are Confucius centers in many uh, European and North American institutions. And these institutions have long raised questions about whether they allow freedom to have a dispassionate critical look at Chinese culture and society. Um, and I think with the entry of Fudan into Europe, European governments will have to decide whether in accepting other universities from China to establish their campuses here, whether these institutions respect the fundamental norms that have been uh, basic to European academic freedom for generations. Please don't misunderstand me. I am, do not want to be part of any emergent, highly ideological cold war against China. I believe strongly that there should be as much uh, academic interchange with Chinese universities, some of which are uh, fantastic institutions, there should be as much exchange as possible. But we need to be very, very clear. These are not institutions that subscribe to uh, international standards of academic freedom. And so cooperation has to lay out very clear guidelines about what we can do together and what we can't. And I think Western governments have been very slow to understand that, and we need to understand that now. But this is not the only threat to academic freedom in Europe. I want to draw your attention to another thing that's become, which is, uh, concerns me greatly as a working rector. Uh, intelligence services in China, Russia, Turkey, Belarus, Egypt, and the Gulf states have made a point for some time of keeping the social media accounts of our international students under surveillance. The globalization of international education has been one of the great things that's happened in the last uh, generation in, in Europe. We're getting students from uh, societies around the world. But in the, in the case of those students who come from authoritarian societies like China or Russia or Turkey, we can be certain that their intelligence officers are watching 
the social media profile of their students. And this has a chilling effect on the capacity of these students to react, to react freely and study freely. Uh, many students also feel that there are students in their midst who are informing on them to the intelligence services back home. Now, if you think, um, in other words, these authoritarian regimes in some cases are reaching right into the classrooms, right into the libraries where we work. And I think we're not as aware of this as we need to be. If you think I'm being um, slightly overheated, um, I want to tell you a little story. CU has a student currently in his fourth month of detention in Cairo, an Egyptian student. He went home in Fe February to see his family, was asked to show up at the police, was immediately locked up. What do they have against him? They have What they have against him are his Facebook posts, critical of the Egyptian regime, that he made while studying at our university. This is a flagrant attack on his academic freedom, on his freedom to think and reflect on his own society. And we need to be aware that this is a serious issue. Uh, we have international students and we need to protect them to the degree that we can from these kinds of uh, pressures. Um, I raise this case because we have some idea in our mind that the real threats to academic freedom are somewhere else. What I'm trying to convey is the sense in which authoritarian regimes through their intelligence services are now reaching right into our student bodies. I saw this at Harvard in 2016. I'm seeing it now at CU. I warn you, this is a very serious and emergent issue. Let me uh, begin to draw towards a conclusion since I don't want to overstay my uh, welcome. Um, let me return to the beginning and just summarize what I've said. Um, academic freedom and institutional autonomy are not the privilege of an academic elite. And if we think of it in those terms, if we allow uh, our enemies, our adversaries in the wider society to define academic freedom in this way, we've lost the battle. What we need to say on the contrary is that if academic freedom is undermined, everyone's freedom is diminished and democracy is sure to suffer. The threats to academic freedom today are serious from authoritarian regimes that are consolidating power in Central Europe. And I cited the example of uh, Hungary, but we could also talk about what's happening in Poland. Um, but we need to focus on the ways in which these regimes in Central Europe are dependent in turn on the support of major authoritarian and resurgent powers like China and Russia. So the tide is not necessarily flowing in the direction of liberty. The threat's not far away, it's already inside our classrooms and we need to be aware of what's at stake. But I think we also need to be aware that this battle for academic freedom and institutional autonomy has been going on for a very long time. Um, it didn't begin in 1991 and it won't end in 2021. Uh, we need to have a historical perspective. Uh, we need to take heart, I think, from the, from the sheer stubborn longevity of universities. As I said right at the beginning, universities are among the oldest freestanding institutions in the world. These traditions of academic self-government by the community of scholars are among the most precious achievements of European liberty. And as our medieval ancestors would surely tell us, you have to fight for them. Princes come and go, cardinals and popes are here and then gone, but universities astonishingly have remained and endured um, and their <clears throat> princely and priestly opponents are no longer with us or no longer uh, as strong as they were. And they've been forced to understand the value, the importance of these self-governing institutions that also happen to be the engine drivers of the modern 21st century economy. I feel optimistic 
as a university rector uh, about the future of academic freedom because I think, and I share this with all of you, I care passionately about these places. My whole life has been spent inside them. My life wouldn't make sense without them. We need to fight for them. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rector Ignatieff. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions or comments uh, by the public. I would have some questions, but I, I don't want to monopolize the, the floor. So maybe we can begin in this room. Uh, and of course, um, the public, uh, the, the speakers of the conference who are online, they are also uh, invited to ask questions or to comment. We still have around 20 minutes for the debate. Um, so, who, who would like to, to take uh, take the floor, maybe in this uh, in this room, or um, maybe I, I should ask the first question. <laughs> um, uh, th thank you again for for this uh, very rich presentation. Um, I will have, uh, in fact, one question, um, one general question, because you, you mentioned the fact that uh, um, you lost you lost this battle. Uh, in, uh, in in Hungary, uh, in spite of uh, the support uh, given by academics from abroad, in spite of the demonstration of uh, Hungarian citizens, you mentioned 80,000 uh, people in the street of Budapest, uh, in spite of many um, um, many speeches by uh, institutions, uh, representatives of institutions, and so on and so forth. How do you explain that it's uh, still possible to, 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 to lose such a battle? Um, uh, did you expect more and from whom? Uh, from European Union, for instance, from other institutions, from the public? The, this is the, the, the question, that, my question is, um, in fact, two, um, has two, has two, um, two uh, elements, because you mentioned also the fact that uh, we need to present academic freedom as uh, not only a, a freedom, a, a right, a liberty for a privileged elite, but it has to resonate in the mind of all the citizens. How to do it? We have the arguments. We know exactly how to, what to say, but how to, to develop the consciousness of academic freedom in the public? Boy, vast, vast question, <clears throat> vast sujet. Um, I won't inflict more of my Canadian French on you. Um, I, I, I think the reasons why we lost have to do, first of all, with uh, the failure of uh, the European project to um, enforce and insist on basic standards of academic freedom across Europe. I think we don't appreciate <clears throat> the weakness of European treaty language in respect of academic freedom. We don't have a, uh, a European-wide charter of academic freedom that has any possibility of being enforced at law. Educational matters are very much within the province or the responsibility of national governments. And after you know, 80 years of European construction, this remains a club of sovereign states. And um, one of the reasons that uh, we did not uh, uh, persuade uh, Orban to act otherwise is that <clears throat> you know, the French president, the German president, the, you know, various people didn't pick up the phone, but they didn't pick up the phone for a very good reason, because that's not how Europe works. The French president understands that he doesn't want the German chancellor to phone him. I mean, everybody ends up defending the, 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 the sovereignty of their national political establishments. I'm not being even critical. I'm simply trying to be descriptive of the entity that we have here, which is called Europe. It's a union of sovereign states and, and <clears throat> no um, political leader in another uh, European state is gonna go to the map politically uh, to change the governance of the university in another country. That's just not how it works. So you're on your own and the only thing that you can do to turn it um, in the case of Hungary is to uh, mobilize domestic support. 
if academic freedom is threatened in the Czech Republic, it'll have to be Czechs who get into the street, mobilize their friends and defend the institution. That's how it goes, same in Poland. Um, uh, the, the solution to these problems is always the democratic mobilization in, in the societies at hand. Our, because we were essentially an American institution a lot of our faculty was Hungarian. We had a we had a good uh, basis of support in 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 Budapest. I don't think we had support in the countryside, and the basis of Mr. Orban's support is in small towns and and villages. We had uh, we had Budapest, and he had uh, Hungary. Is I guess what I would say is a straight straight up political answer to why to why we lost. But the broader context is that. Um, Europe has very weak institutions for protecting academic freedom. That's just the way of the world. And in addition, it's a, it's a union of sovereign states unwilling to intervene, particularly uh, in the educational choices of, of each society. So that's, you know, that's where we are. As to the broader question that you ended with, which is how we build um, uh, support for um, uh, universities in um, in Europe. I just cite this one example, which is the AstraZeneca Oxford University partnership on vaccines. Uh, nothing has done more to rebuild uh, public support for universities in the United Kingdom than the demonstrable uh, success of this partnership in bringing to uh, the ordinary public vaccines that were um, the result of uh, work in university labs. And people forget why that happened. It happened because Oxford has invested for 40 years in vaccine research uh, in relation to uh, the vaccine needs of developing countries. And so they were ready when this crisis hit. Uh, this kind of uh, galvanic effect, uh, I think, has tremendously help to uh, build, um, you know, ordinary people think, well, yeah, these are the guys who develop the vaccines. And we need more of that. We need more. Um, we need more work, uh, more research that comes out of universities that demonstrably uh, is a benefit to, to the public. Let, let, let me make clear, I understand the limits of what I'm saying. You know, I'm, I'm a historian. My professional training is a historian. Most of what historians do, God bless us, is perfectly useless. I don't want to end up being backed into a situation in which I say the only way universities can survive is if they're useful and, you know, um, but there has to be some element in which um, a university rector can say, this is what this university does for you. You just have to be able to say that in some uh, credible way. And then you could go on your way doing all the wonderfully useless, abstract, philosophical, no possible social benefit thing that I love about universities. I'm giving now the floor to uh, Jacob Vogel, uh, who is, I guess, in Berlin. And uh, he's the director of uh, Centre Marc Bloch uh, in Berlin, so he's a very close colleague to, to us. Please, Jacob, you, you have uh, the floor. So I want to come back, uh, um, Mr. Ignatiev, to what you have just uh, talked about. And um, as um, somebody who, with uh, a lot of uh, French and German colleagues, uh, but also uh, together with uh, Jérôme, uh, uh, as we are very um, interested in um, uh, well, supporting and, and helping the different institutions uh, all over Europe and beyond uh, to, um, to develop uh, academic freedom um, in a much broader sense. I think uh, what you said is very important uh, and a lot of things uh, I subscribe uh, completely. Um, as an historian myself, uh, there is just a point that I wanted to make to set uh, what you said in a broader context as well. Uh, of course, uh, what you said about the European Union and the lack of um, building up a strong sense of 
uh, academic freedom as a part, uh, a central part of our collective um, identity and uh, uh, having this also supported by uh, some uh, institutional frameworks. Um, and I completely agree with you uh, on this critique, but I think that what you have uh, left out uh, and which is not so unimportant for an international institution as your uh, university uh, was also the broader um, global political contacts uh, and the lack of support um, I would say that you get, got from, from the American administration uh, at that time. Um, and I think that under uh, the actual president right now, uh, things would certainly have uh, happened in a different way. I don't know whether or not you would have succeeded at the end, but uh, at least um, um, the, the general trend uh, of uh, uh, developing of uh, populist uh, and illiberal democracies uh, was uh, also very much uh, uh, driven um, by uh, what was happening in the United States. And um, although uh, we in, in Europe uh, have our own problems and, and, and still have to struggle with that in a proper sense, we, uh, we are in a, a kind of connected world where these kind of things uh, uh, matter a lot. And I think this is uh, also a, a point that we have to take into account. And I hope that uh, uh, actually, um, if we try to develop uh, academic freedom in Europe uh, further, uh, and if we can get the, the support by the new Biden administration for these kind of activities would be very important. And I think uh, we will have to stand up for this uh, all together, uh, uh, wherever we are in the world. And you could see the developments in Brazil and, and elsewhere uh, as well. But uh, once more, this just adds uh, a small part to the broader uh, picture that you give me. And thank you very much for, for your presentation. All right. your, your remarks are very penetrating and it gives me the opportunity. I've never had in my life to pay homage to Mark Bloch. What a great historian. What a insp real inspiration to me as a young student. I, I, I say this with feeling in, a, in an audience of people from France. I mean, people like Mark Bloch are an inspiration to every historian trained in my generation. So that's just by the by. Um, your, your point about America is very well taken uh, and, it, and it, it illustrates, I think, a point that's very important for our discussion about power and knowledge and academic freedom, which is that it always has a very important geostrategic dimension. Um, we, ran into trouble with Orban in 2017. Um, and we ran into trouble with Orban within days of the election of Donald Trump. Uh, I, can, I could give you chapter and verse. The minute the Orban regime understood that Donald Trump was gonna be in the White House from November, 2016 onwards, um, they prepared their attack on us. Uh, prior to November 2016, we had good relations. From one day to the next, it changed. Um, I, can, I, can, I can tell lots of stories about it. Uh, that just highlights the importance of what you're saying. Um, I, I don't, you know, I can't resist taking a few shots at Europe, but there's clearly the geostrategic context here is very important. If you don't have a strong uh, Western liberal democratic alliance standing up for this geostrategically, uh, little universities like ours can't prevail. You, you really need um, the big powers to make a, a commitment in defense of academic freedom and, and stick with it. And everybody knows that the American defense of academic freedom has its ambiguities. Um, this is not an unconditional defense of the foreign policy of the United States by any means, but the absence of the United States in these countries sure makes it more difficult. And for us, it was this is very relevant because we're a US accredited institution. We're a very rare breed. We're accredited in Europe. We're an Austrian university now. We were a Hungarian university. 
but we are also an American university. And this model uh, has been wonderful for us because it allows us to represent what's good about American academic life and what's great about European academic life and try and bring them together. But if you don't have support from the United States, you're in big, you're in big trouble. Absolutely right, uh, Mr. Vogel. Thank you for your comment. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm giving now the, the floor to uh, Mrs. Lenkarovna, Vice Rector of Charles University. Thank you very much for your intervention. It was very interesting for us. We supported you as well as Charles University. Also, as a member of Europeum, we gave you a special status within the framework of Europeum. My question is, how do you feel and how do you do now in Vienna? Uh, how happy and flourishing the Central European University is. It gives me an opportunity to thank uh, Charles and you personally for, for your, your support. Um, you know, CU never forgets we're a, we're a 30 year old in institution dealing with universities like yours that are 700 years old. So we're aware that we're new boys, as we say in English, um, and deeply grateful for the support and the of, of Charles and uh, other universities across the region. Um, how do we feel now? Uh, well, it, we're in Vienna, which means we're a little closer to Prague. And that's, that sounds like a good thing. Um, uh, Vienna is a important university town. Uh, there are something like, I think, 280,000 students studying in Vienna. So it's a very good place for our students. Uh, we've had a very warm welcome from the city of Vienna. Uh, this is, I think, a thing to note. Um, smart cities in Europe now understand how important universities are to their development and growth. Um, the city of Vienna has a whole policy about encouraging universities. I hope Prague has the same. I hope Warsaw will do the same. Um, uh, universities are essentially urban uh, downtown kinds of places and they are to be vulgar about it tremendous creators of employment and opportunity and um, international exchange uh, i think vienna understands that um, uh, we've we think we've got a, a uh, we've got a, a future in vienna that's permanent we maintain a presence in Budapest, I hasten to add. We have a campus there still. We have a democracy institute there. I never want to lower the flag in Budapest because our heart is there. But I think our future, there's no question, our future is in uh, Vienna. And Vienna is an interesting place in Central Europe, as I hardly need tell anybody in Prague. It feels itself to be a Western European city, but the place is chock-a-block with Hungarians and Czechs and Poles and Yugoslavs and whatever. So it, whether it likes it or not, it's a, it's a Central European city. And I hope our presence will reinforce that aspect of Vienna's identity in the future. Thank you very much. And um, really many thanks for your very um, inspiring and uh, I would say deep presentation. I will have just a few comments and one question. Um, uh, I very much uh, appreciated the uh, uh, historic point of view you presented by just uh, recalling how old universities are in Central Europe. And um, if I put this, let's say in a modern perspective or in today's perspective, I would say that within the EU, with the idea of the alliance of uh, European universities, we are, let's say, trying to rebuild some uh, networks that already existed in the Middle Ages, but trying to build them in a new uh, way or in a new modern way, or that they are, let's say, uh, sons and daughters of the Erasmus program. Uh, many, uh, there are three uh, alliance of European universities um, uh, involving French and uh, Czech uh, universities here. And I think maybe this is uh, 
one of the promising um, futures for the um, uh, for universities in in Europe. So this was just more a comment, but I I very much appreciated the uh, uh, your recalling the um, uh, the uh, historic uh, perspective for universities. Um, my second comment was more on um, sharing uh, your view that with social media, um, with disinformation being more and more spread, uh, we need uh, universities uh, to just, um, I wouldn't say stop emotions, but uh, lead students to get back to facts, uh, explanations so that they are made, uh, let's say, citizens that are aware of their rights and their ability to uh, stand up for facts and not um, emotions. My last question would be on what you mentioned with Fudan um, or the uh, Confucius um, Institute that sometimes are embedded in, um, in universities. This is a very worrying trend. Um, when you look, for example, at what is happening today in Australia, in fact, uh, some of the uh, Confucius um, uh, Institute are so much embedded that the universities that had a policy of attracting so many students just now fight against the government not to criticize, I mean, China's policy when it comes to human rights or uh, political orientations. And this is just an example uh, going live on what is really happening as a grip slowly being put on universities and then uh, preventing our, let's say, European or Western tradition to carry on with those academic freedoms. My question would be, um, uh, what is your assessment of this attempt or of the spread of this grip um, in uh, Central Europe? And I would just finish with one um, point. Within the EU, we adopted a strategy or we defined a strategy on uh, relationship with China in three words, saying that um, uh, China is for us a, a partner, uh, is a competitor and is a systemic rival. And uh, when we look at uh, the questions of this slow um, tightening or this will to um, uh, prevent uh, the ability to, to criticize, I think we are there in the um, way by which the systemic rival wants to prevent us to preserve or to keep our model of academic freedom. So sorry for being long, but I would really appreciate if you could enlighten us uh, with your knowledge of Central Europe of what um, or how you see this trend for, uh, for Central Europe. Thank you so much. Picking up your three words, I mean, I, I, this is a difficult issue for us. Your Australian example shows that uh, universities can actually get um, really substantially constrained. They can, in the Australian case, be so dependent on the inflows of Chinese students and the, the institutional embedding of the Confucian Institutes really does begin to constrain these institutions. And that's, a, I think, a warning sign for Europe and it's a warning sign that we need to heed and, and avoid. Um, I do want to put some emphasis on the word partnership that you mentioned at the beginning, because, um, you know, this is such a toxic, highly ideological um, moment in which, you know, the Biden administration and the Trump administration are defining the next uh, generation as a basically a battle for supremacy between two powers and Europe is then having to negotiate um, between the two. I, I think from a university point of view, there's a tragedy in the making here. Uh, and the tragedy is that we lose contact with some great universities. I mean, Fudan is not a, you know, Fudan's a serious place. I've lectured at Tsinghua in Beijing. These are serious institutions. And while their social science and humanities uh, areas are substantially constrained, their islands and areas in these universities full of honest, decent, hardworking scholars. And we want to maintain contact with them. And we want to make sure that great French students get to spend time in 
Beijing learning about this extraordinary society, it would be a catastrophe for the West and catastrophe for China if in this um, resurgent um, uh, battle, we reproduce all the worst bits of the Cold War in which it was almost impossible to find out what was happening in China. It was almost impossible to really get a sense of what was happening in the Soviet Union and, and these misunderstandings made the battle worse and more protracted. So I think universities have to struggle to find a way to maintain a partnership with uh, Chinese universities while clearly laying down the lines, the red lines that they can't cross in terms of scholarly freedom and exchange. And this is, a, this is an urgent geostrategic matter. We're, we're debating at the moment whether the whole COVID-19 um, epidemic originated in a scientific lab in, a, in, a, in, in, in China. And the inability of the Chinese to be straight with us about what happened in a, in a, in a research setting is potentially of global importance. So we've got to handle this very, very carefully. And all you can do, it seems to me, is define as I say, our, our red lines. We want to have dialogue. We want to have conference with the Chinese. We want to do this and that, but here's how we do things. And we can't trade that, um, trade that away. In terms of your specific question, Ambassador, about Central and Eastern Europe, um, the Fudan University uh, project is part of another project, the Belt and Braces or whatever it's called the building of the railway between Budapest and Belgrade, um, uh, increasing uh, uh, infrastructure investment by China that deepens the dependency of these uh, uh, countries and these economies on um, Chinese loans. Um, uh, this is becoming a very hot subject in, in the next election in, in um, Hungary in 2022. Does, does Hungary want to put itself in debt permanently to a, a foreign power like China? This is an issue in Africa, um, as you know, Zambia or Kenya or these places discover what it's like to get a Chinese loan. They suddenly discover they, they're, they're, they're trapped by the throat. This is uh, aid and loans that essentially tighten the control of this regime on their dependence and, and this pattern, which began in Africa, is beginning to be developed in Greece, in, uh, in the Balkans, in uh, Serbia, and in uh, Hungary. And I think um, clearly um, the big strategic question for Europe is, it has always been the case that when in confident and sometimes complacent Western capitals, they've looked at a place like Hungary and basically said, so where else are they going to go, right? I mean, the EU is their only possible destination. It's just possible now that there's another destination, which is that these become satellites of the ascendant power of the 21st century. I don't think this needs to happen, but this is the, this is the challenge for Europe to understand that European integration was driven by a sense that there's only one direction for uh, Central and Eastern European states. They can only go towards integration with uh, Europe. And to the astonishment of Western European elites, it's actually a vote winner to get up in a Hungarian election or even a Polish election and say, you know, Brussels is Moscow. You know, Brussels is this coercive, uh, power extinguishing our national freedom. And if this stuff gets pushed much further, then to the question, where else are you going to go? Some of these authoritarian leaders may say, well, actually, I'm, I'm cozier in the embrace of a, of, a, of, a, of a global power that lends me a lot of stuff, um, creates institutions that don't raise difficult questions for me, and so on. I, I I realize, Mr. Ambassador, that I'm at the edge of credibility here. This might even seem far-fetched, but it's not off the table in my view. And, and this development of 
uh, Fudan, the development of the railway, the development of these um, connections, the obvious development of uh, uh, intelligence capabilities in Budapest and other places, um, poses very interesting strategic questions for Europe that need to be handled calmly and serenely. And to go back to where I started, need to be handled in such a way that we don't lose the engagement, the partnership with China on science, technology, and learning that is, I think, a critical way to avoid the geostrategic conflict becoming um, a, a, a battle of uh, uh, that becomes zero sum and therefore geostrategically dangerous. I'm sorry to go on so long with the question or the answer, but the question was of great importance. And thank you very much for asking it. Thank you so much, Mr. Professor Ignatieff, for, for your time. Um, please uh, say, Margot um, uh, Vargas, you said that he has a strong French admirer in Prague, <laughs> if you have the occasion. Thank you again for your time.